before I start, I just want to say I'm not an engineer anymore, but I want to thank Engine Yard for having uh, essentially funded the Rails 3 effort. Um, in addition to Rails 3 getting funded, and obviously me and Carl, there's a lot of community uh, multiplier effect that happens. Uh, people like Jose, uh, Kaleem, and then uh, Aaron Patterson is in the audience, and Santiago Pastrino is in the audience. So we got a bunch of new people that Engine Yard didn't have to pay for, but through Engine Yard, Funding of full-time people to sit around and take questions and help people get started um, really, I think, made the difference to Rails 3, and will make the difference moving forward. I think Rails 3 um, is so strong now in terms of the community that uh, not having as many full-time people, although Aaron is full-time on it now, um, I think, uh, I think that it will not be. Uh, it's it basically we did our job, right? We did the job that we set out to do a couple years ago. So. I'm really excited. I want to thank NGR. NGR is going to continue uh, putting some time, energy, and money into Rails 3.1 and moving forward, so that's great, and I uh, just want to thank them. Um, so my original talk title was Extending Rails 3. Um, there's a much better place to find out about it because it's actually not a 30-minute topic. Um, Jose wrote a book that he's going to be releasing really soon called Rails 3 Internals for Daily Use. You can tell he's from Brazil. Um, it has all these topics and a lot more. And again, every one of these topics is easily a 30 minute talk if you just touch the surface. So uh, again, I could have done it, but I figured that you guys might want to know a little about Rails 3.1. So I'm going to talk about that. So the first thing is uh, engines have just over undergone a very large overhaul. And this guy, Drogas, give him some love on Twitter if you want. Um, he actually did this as a Ruby Summer Code project. And like Jose's project last year to overall the generators, it was a pretty ambitious project. And uh, he basically did everything we had hoped that he would do in some more, pretty much just delivering on the promise of the mountable apps idea that we had a few years ago. So I'm going to talk about sort of what engines have now for a few minutes. Um, but just give him some love. So, First of all, migration. This is the last feature that wasn't in Rails 3.0 migrations from the engines plugin. Uh, so the way it works is that you do rate rail ties, copy migration. So any engine can just ship with a migration directory and you copy them. And then it goes and it takes the, for instance, oh, column rb and moves it into a timestamped add column with the name of the engine so that uh, if you run that over and over again as you update the, the gem, it won't continually copy out old ones. But you have in your app a record of the end of the migration. Uh, there was a lot of discussion, probably bike shedding level discussion, about exactly how this feature needs to be implemented and the copying approach, uh, specifically solving the how you can make sure you don't do copy things, turned out to be by far the best solution. And I'm happy that we finally have one that works well and will ship with Rails 3.1. Um, the second really big thing that there are solutions for, but there's no canonical solution for in Rails 3 with engines is static assets. Specifically, it's nice to have static assets that you don't have to have some kind of like per engine task for copying or symlinking, right? So right now there are solutions, but every engine basically provides some mechanism for copying the assets. And uh, what you really want is to be able to have engines just put their stuff in a public directory and just have that work correctly without any additional work. So the way this is going to work is that there are, there's a public directory, which is like your regular public directory, and then you might have a few engines that have public directories. In development mode, the static, the action dispatch static middleware will serve all three of them, so you don't have to have like Nginx or something like that serving your static assets. In production mode, the static middleware will still serve assets from things like device and pull, but Nginx will serve the main public directory. Um, something that we're doing just to make sure that that doesn't start to become a performance problem is the action dispatch static middleware will get will become a pre-populated hash. So instead of having to scan the directory as it does right now for every single request, which is why it's not on by default to Rails 3 right now, um, we scan the directories up front once it's it, you're in production mode after all. We get a hash and that way determining whether or not there's an asset is a hash lookup and uh, we can do this performantly without any problem. And we actually just finalized the details for how this is going to work this morning. So it's great. Um, the second really major feature in the new engines is the idea of a self-contained engine. So in Rails 2.3 and Rails 3, 
and the old engines plug in. Engines were basically a hack that let you take part of your application and put it somewhere else. But at the end, it basically became one application in one. And you couldn't, for instance, have middleware that was around your engine. You couldn't, uh, if you namespace things, that you had to deal with the effects of namespacing everywhere. So everybody knows sort of how namespacing affects your application. If you have an admin namespace, it changes a bunch of things. And that's sort of fine for an admin namespace, but if you have an engine, you don't want to have to modify all this stuff and understand how namespaces work just to be able to use them. So Rails 3.1 adds the idea of a separate namespace engine. And a namespace engine is essentially a standalone Rails application without the boot up stuff. So you only need to boot up and initialize an app one time, but you may have applications that are standalone that you maybe want to rack, mount as rack applications or uh, just use as rack applications anywhere in your, in your app. And uh, this, the isolated engine does that. Um, one really obvious, this is from uh, Drogas Peter's blog. Uh, one really obvious thing is that you don't want to be including your main application's helpers in your engine, right? You only want to include your engine's helpers. So that's like the first thing that's sort of important, but, and, and sort of illustrates the kind of problem that you have when you start thinking about this, right? Um, another thing is that now, uh, if, you use, if you use namespace, right? Um, and I think the name, the name namespace will probably change to be more revealing about what's going on. That's the sort of the first implementation. Um, every engine that is is an isolated engine gets its own namespace, and so uh, that its own router, which means that you can do stuff like post URL that points at the engines. Um, you still might want to point at the main application one, and so you could do main app dot post URL and that goes to the main app, and vice versa in the main application you can do blog dot post URL. Um, another thing is, by default, if you do this, you, uh, it does blog, post, path, post, and that's because it flattens out the namespace and makes the URL helper. But what you really want is post path. So um, basically, if you're in an isolated engine, if you do form for post, it, it sees that you're in an isolated engine with a namespace and switches to using <coughs> post path. And all these things are really just designed to make it easier to build isolated engines, almost like they're regular applications, right? So you don't have to be thinking about the namespace all the time in a way that's unusual for building a regular application. Um, similarly, if you did this, uh, you would get blog post title and you have to use params blog post. Um, in an isolated engine, it's just post title and you can use params post, right? And that's because you only get one post at a time, so even if you have a bunch of forms that are from different engines, only one of them will be submitted at, at a time, that way you don't need to be namespaced. Um, the way this will work is that you can mount an engine like this, and this is actually the same API for mounting any rack application. So, the same way that you can say mount some Sinatra app to blog, you can say mount blog engine. That's because blog engine is just a rack application. And in your application, then you get to say blog post path, uh, like I said before. Um, but you can change that name. So blog is just uh, whatever you define the namespace to be. If you want a different name to be used for uh, routing helpers, you can pick one by using as, and then you get my blog. You can also uh, form for and all the helpers that take. Um, that take objects to make URLs out of them, allow you to pass in as the first parameter now of uh, an application. So uh, the main app, this is how you would point, make a form for the main app in the engine. And uh, similarly, this is how you make a form for the blog in the main application. So um, that basically, we've made the idea of applications versus class. Um, th there is only one application, but the only thing that an application does that's different from what an engine does is that it boots up and initializes and has a bunch of middleware that only makes sense to have once, like the static middleware. Um, but engines at this point, they actually applications inherit from the engine class, and engines are basically full-fledged first class applications um, just without the boot up dunk. There's a bunch of other things that you have to do, like uh, image path doing the right thing, DOM names, rendering partials, IETN, and that all just works almost the same way that I showed before, right? Basically, Pretend there's no namespace because you've told us that you have a namespace and then everything just works. So again, give this guy some love. I think this is already in, this is already in Rails 3.1. I'm really excited about it and uh, couldn't have happened if he didn't do the work. So that's great. Uh, the next really big thing is even a further shift towards HTTP. So this is page caching in Rails 3.0. Um, this is the cache page method. You can see stuff like file utils.maker. And that's because it's hard coded to essentially the file system and Nginx and these strategies. So the idea is that you take the things, you put them in the public directory, and then Nginx and Apache have a rewrite to point at it. And that works great for a lot of cases, but doesn't work great for a lot of other cases. Um, 
And in general, is, is kind of a weird strategy, especially as Rails 3 has gotten more, um, as Rails 3 has gotten more agnostic, it's kind of weird that we still have sort of a core piece of functionality hard-coded to the file system, especially as we embrace HTTP everywhere else, and HTTP actually has mechanisms for this. So, uh, for instance, if you want to use Akamai for your caching, suddenly you have to do a whole other thing, because uh, we built something in that only applies to the file system. So, Rails 3.0 has built in HTTP caching, but we're going to make it even more hard-coded, uh, which is weird. <laughs> but no, we're going to make uh, Rails 3 more associated with HTTP, which is actually a pretty big deal. So, how many people know what these methods are? Raise your hand if you know what these methods are. Okay, so more than a lot of other places I've asked that question, but not a lot, right? So, uh, basically what these methods are is they let you do something like this. Um, so you can say, if stale, and then say e tag and point at a, a post. And what that will do is Rails will automatically generate uh, e tag, and that's just basically a unique identifier for that object without you having to sort of know how to do that. So Rails has a heuristic for figuring that out, and then any subsequent requests, and I'll show in a minute how the HTTP protocol works around this, any subsequent request will not go and render the template. So that's usually the most expensive part. The expensive part isn't like finding something from your database, it's actually going and rendering everything. So this allows you to say, I will serve this template once, and then any subsequent times, I'm just gonna basically bail at this point and tell the browser that it can just continue using whatever it was using um, just FYI, you probably don't know yet, people aren't that familiar with custom responders yet, but you can easily take this and make every single use of respond with uh, automatically do that e thing if you want. Uh, it's quite easy, and Jose actually has a responder gem that does it. So um, I expect that as people get more familiar with how the respond with API works, they'll start building things like e tags into how, their, how every one of their controllers works. So let me talk about caching a little bit. So this is the normal way things work, right? Every time the client wants something, it makes a hit to the server, right? And, um, if you add in fresh one, it works like this instead. So you have the client, the client says, get hello. That goes to the server, right? And the server generates an e-tag. That e-tag is just a unique identifier for that object. And it sends back the e-tag to the client. And the next time the client wants hello, for whatever reason, it says, if not, mod if not modified, and then sends the thing, sends the, uh, through, goes to the server, and the server says, you know what, I already, that's the same, because you said fresh when that e-tag, and it returns back a 304, and that means that you didn't have to do most of the expensive logic of that action, you just have to do the work of going and getting that one object from the database and, sh and having Rails generate e-tag. So now you only have to do one hit for slash hello, plus a little Ruby logic, but not a lot of Ruby logic. So that actually works pretty nicely. The problem is that if you have a bunch of browsers, which everybody does, all of a sudden, and since the browser is really the only thing in the equation that has HTTP semantics for most people, all of a sudden you get n hits, right? As many hits as you have browsers. And that stops being as useful. So uh, one really good solution is to put something in the middle, like Akamai. Akamai is the thing that's getting all the hits, and then it's doing the e-tag work, right? So it it's basically becomes the browser, and now your Rails app only gets hit once with a full request and Akamai has the e-tag for everybody. Uh, another way to do that is with Varnish. So um, Heroku has a Varnish layer in front and you can install it pretty much on your application. But again, Varnish is not necessarily something that everybody has in all cases. So um, it's something that is nice and, and has this nice effect but isn't necessarily built in. And because of the fact that Varnish is so unusual for people and because of the fact that Akamai is really expensive, People haven't really embraced fresh when and stale custom art. The APIs that Rails gives you to make this work as much as they should have, right? They have a really, there's a really nice way to do um, caching validation built into Rails. All you have to do is say fresh when, e tag, give me the object, done, right? It's like a one liner, where in like Java it would be like a 20 liner to do the same thing. Uh, we have a really nice way, but because it's so, not so useful, people don't use it so much. So what we're going to be doing in Rails 3.1 is shipping Rack Cache, which is essentially a little varnish, together with Rails, and now you have the same semantics. So in case you're wondering, Rack Cache, it sounds like, oh, that's nice for development, but you would never do that in production, because it sounds like it would store all that uh, caching in memory. Rack Cache is actually pretty smart. It stores all the data in any caching layer, has an API for that, and 
the rack cache that Rails is going to ship with is just going to use you whatever your act support cache is. So whatever you set your Rails cache to be will be used. So if you set it to memcache, we'll use memcache for that. If you set it to file system, we'll use that. If you have a special Redis store, you use that, we'll use that, right? So essentially, we're going to be storing things for you using HTTP semantics. And that means that if you just decide, uh, if you set fresh one or stale question mark in your, in your actions, you get caching for free. And the really nice thing is that unlike page caching, which you can still use, you still use page caching, um, but unlike page caching where you have to actively invalidate the cache, you have to say, this is no longer valid, with HTTP caching, you don't have to do that because the e-tag system is pretty flexible and you get to actually look at the e-tag, do very little amount of Ruby code and return right away if you need to, which means you don't have to do invalidation. So that's pretty nice. Um, and it gives you like 90% of the performance impact or more of page caching with a lot less pain. Uh, one thing that this does out of the box is it lets us, we're going to build in and talk about this in a second, uh, compilation of, stat of static assets. And we build, we allows us to edge cache things like SCSS. So right now, you want to do you want to take static assets and compile them up front because you don't want to be having to render them all the time, right? But if what we do is we have caching baked in, now we can actually just make SCSS or coffee script or whatever, a thing that gets rendered right away on the first hit, but because we have caching built in, we don't have to be sending it every time. We, the caching layer is automatically handling it. So we don't have to worry about rate compiling as part of our deployment process or anything like that. We can use HTTP caching to handle how strong or weak we want our caching to be, and we can build that into Rails. Um, so a really nice thing about this, again, is that it means that fresh one and stale, which are relatively unknown, can become relatively known because they'll suddenly have a really big impact. They'll be a powerful way of doing something like page caching, but really cheaply in terms of mental overhead. So the next thing is, next really big feature is assets. And the thing about assets is that ERB and SCSS are really conceptually very similar. They're, you have something and you want to serve something else to the browser, and you have to make it go through something first before you can do that. And unfortunately, ERB is something that you don't have to do anything for, right? You just make it that ERB file and everything goes away. And SCSS is something where you either have to have a very, very slow, weird middleware that they don't, they, they don't like and only turn on in development, or you run like great SCSS compiler or something like that in your deploy script. Um, but you can't just, it doesn't just work like you like ERB, right? And the solution for this is to build in the idea of SCL basically compiling CSS and compiling JavaScript to Rails. So instead of it being public, a public directory, which is basically a junk drawer for everything, um, if you want to, if you have compiled assets, if you have SCSS, if you want to minify, if you want to combine a bunch of assets together, all this becomes so part of the process, just like compiling ERB is part of the process. So um, you can move your assets in Rails 3.1 to app assets. I think we'll still support the public directory for non-compiled assets, but for assets that are SCSS or CoffeeScript or less, um, you can move them to app assets, and then they'll work exactly the same as ERB. It'll be app.css.scss. SCSS will be a rendering engine. We'll ship with SCSS. So, um, It'll basically be just like ERB. And if you want to support, if you want to use less or something like that, it will be really easy for the less guys to make a, a plugin, just like the Hamlet guys made a plugin to support it. Um, and then you'll also have, again, multiple directories just like before. So SAS, the way SAS works today, like I said, is that we compile at a runtime. Uh, compile at a runtime goes to the file system, like page caching, and then we have Nginx and Apache. This kind of falls apart, again, with the read only file system. Right, so it's, it, as you can see, it's a similar problem to what we were talking about before page caching, right? And the solution is the same. The solution is uh, instead of having an SCSS compile phase, we have an SCSS template handler that serves an HTTP response, wrap cache grabs the HTTP response, and then you can drop in varnish or Akamai, and it just works. So um, again, I, there's a lot going on here, but the short version of all of this is SCSS becomes like ERB. SCSS is a thing you can say at the end of app foo.css.scss, and then we'll have the notion of template handler. So everybody who does this doesn't have to make their own mechanism for compiling all that. Um, of course, isolated engines get their own app assets. So isolated engines, uh, you can just put things in there, and then it will work just like I talked before about uh, isolated engines. And 
The cool thing about this is that it becomes really easy to package up something like jQuery UI or um, any, any one of these widget libraries that has CSS, JavaScript, and images all in one place. And right now you have to take that out, you have to put it somewhere, you may have to go through it and change the URLs because maybe you put them in a different location. Right, so there's sort of a process to install on jQuery UI. It becomes really easy for us to ship jQuery UI as a gem. And then because of the fact that, like I said before, assets are just, uh, assets are just controlled by the rack cache layer. I had that like 500 slides ago. Um, now you don't have to do any copying, right? So you have images go in the public directory, JavaScript and CSS go in the app assets directory in your, in your engine, and you just do gem install jQuery UI, or Rails jQuery UI, and now you can just do uh, JavaScript's include tag, jQuery UI.js, and everything just works. So I'm sort of talking about the mechanisms that that will, that, that will be used in that, but it's a nice, it will work nicely out of the box. Um, Spriting, so DHH talked about this a little bit. Um, Chris announced last week, I guess, that Compass and Lemonade are merging and I'm going to talk about what that API looks like, but the important thing is that it will be built into Rails 3.1. Uh, 3 so, basically the way it will work is that your images directory will have a new sprites directory inside of it, and then each, every subdirectory in the sprites directory is a bunch of images that should be combined into a sprite. Uh, the basic usage is that you will just import sprite slash toolbar, and then you include everything, and you get this CSS out of it, and so you can just add class equals toolbar new to anything and it will just work. So basically this means that instead of, um, that if you have an image like toolbar slash new, uh, you get a bunch of CSS classes that you can apply to whatever and uh, the sizes and background positions and all that are built. Um, you probably don't want to do that though. You probably don't want to have to be forced to use toolbar new in your markup. You want to have your markup be semantic. So more conventional usage might look something like this. Um, you import Sprite's toolbar. Um, so Sprite's toolbar is just a name that is the directory for your images. And then you include toolbar Sprite new, toolbar Sprite open for every class, and then you get this out of it. And now you can, now those classes get automatically Sprite. So now you have a div with an idea of toolbar and class is new, and it just works. So that's good. Um, I talked about auto flushing a little bit on my blog. I'll just reiterate sort of. So. In Rails 2, in Rails 2, 3, and 3.0, we render the template first. The template populates a bunch of content cores, and then we render the layout. The layout gets the content cores, and then when we're all the way done, we send it to the browser. Um, ideally, you don't want to do that. Ideally, you want to be flushing to the browser as quickly as possible. So, Rails 3.0 looks more. Rails 3.1 will look more like this, um, where you basically you start rendering the layout first, and as soon as you say yield JavaScript, you go into the template. You Render the template until you get a content for JavaScript, and then you go back to rendering the layout. Um, it doesn't actually change the programming model, so this is a nice thing about this. Um, the details of how this works aren't hugely important because it doesn't really change the programming model of what you're already doing today, right? What you're doing today is you have a template that has a bunch of content cores in it, right? And those content cores, you have to render the entire template first because that's how Ruby works. And then you have to run, render the entire layout in order to get those things. Uh, this is just a way of modifying the control flow so that we can jump back and forth. But from your perspective, you can still make a template, the template can still have content for it, you can still make a layout, the layout can still yield, and we just will automatically behind the scenes flush whatever we think we can. Um, I wrote a blog post about this that is in a lot more details and has actual sample code for how this could work. Um, the important thing about this though is that there are some caveats especially around exception handling. So once you flush, you obviously can't take the flush back. So uh, I think a lot of people, when they saw this, they were like, surely there's a way. It's like, there kind of isn't, right? Because you've already flushed. So, the whole point is that we flush before we've done some other code. So, um, so there's an exception handling problem that we really can't get around. And that will mean that we will have to say that it's optional and something that you have, you have to turn on. But it's something that you will turn on and then it will work. Not, it's not something you turn on and then you have to say flush all the time, right? So this is something that we spend a lot of time thinking about. Uh, in PHP, there's a flush method that you can run. Um, and that has a, a couple of issues. One of them is it's just annoying to have to, um, 
you have to know about when you should be doing flushing. But another problem is that it's sort of a one-time deal with Rails. You'll flush and then we'll have to jump into the layout for the templating continue. Where this solution lets us jump back and forth really conveniently. And it lets us not change the programming model at all while giving you a really nice experience for your users. So it's cool, but um, we're definitely going to have to make it something that you turn on and sort of accept the consequences because there are things like exceptions, not being able to return a 500 status that you just have to live with. Um, we're going to use chunk encoding, which is the HTTP spec around this sort of thing that lets us send headers at the end. So we'll have some more flexibility than I think a lot of people realize, but we, that doesn't let us change the status of it. So we'll never be able to make a 500 if there was a 200. And that's why. Yes? Sure. I'm running out of time. As long as you throw the exception in the controller before the pivot. Yeah, so obviously controller exceptions will be 500. The problem is that if you have, uh, in your template, if you have an exception that gets called because you like lazy, you did a query lazily, which is good, right? Now we can set up our queries in the controller using an API that looks a lot like what we did before that wasn't lazy. Now we do auto flushing, and so. Uh, we're, all we're doing later is we're iterating over a query. We think we've already gotten it, but we didn't. Because we have basically all this infrastructure now to let us do everything really lazy, and flushing really takes advantage of that, because now we do almost nothing in the controller, and things happen as are needed. But that query might result in an error for some reason. Right? You might have, have made the query wrong. And then you get an exception, and there's really not nothing you can do about it. So I think the infrastructure is really nice, and if people uh, either write reasonable code or don't do, yes, or don't do, or can put up with the consequences, and we come up with some good solutions, I think that would be great. But um, we can't turn it on for everybody, because it, it, there are consequences. And I think something like this will probably be the API. Um, I also don't know if we'll get it to 3.1, but it will, it's something that we're actively working on, and we'll get into like the next release in which we have something that works. Um, I'll just, there's a couple more things I have, like one minute, uh, Exceptron. This is basically real, uh, Merv, Merv's exception controller, so you can rescue exceptions with a controller that has access to everything, so you can respond with, you can render, whatever. Uh, a lot of people in, we found this convenient in Merv because a lot of times you have an exception, and you kind of just want to do something that you could do in a regular Rails controller. You want to render a template and have it have access to the request, right? But you can't really easily with Rails 2.3 or Rails 3, and this makes it really easy to do. Again, there's some risk involved because you may end up uh, raising another exception, right? You may have an infinite loop of exceptions. So this is definitely also something that people want to hop into if they know what they're doing and are really careful. It's an exception handler, right? So be careful about not raising another exception in there. Or weird things might happen. Merv had like a, if it happens five times, we time out. But, but seriously, it's, it's, it's a good feature, it's a nice feature, but it's arbitrary code, so don't have another exception. Um, and I, again, it's something that won't necessarily be there by default, but it's a nice thing, feature that will be there if you want it in Rails 3.1. Uh, couple last things, performance. Uh, we're going to be working on performance a lot in Rails 3.1. Um, Aaron's going to be working on Arrow, has been working on Arrow. Uh, should be awesome. I'm going to spend some time on Action Pack, mainly because I did a lot of work on Action Pack and then didn't for the last like three months of the 3.0 release. And I suspect there's some regressions. And I also know that there's a lot of stuff I didn't do that I know that I can do. So. Uh, just spending some time on Action Pack would be great, and Emilio's been doing some work on Active Record. Um, so between Aaron and Emilio, Active Record should be fast in 3.1, and uh, I should be getting Action Pack under control. I think some other people are as well. And I, I think this is a possible goal. Um, just because we did that much more than that in some parts of Rails 3, and we just need to deal with some hotspots, and uh, that's it.